this lecture is on the standard model and conservation laws. Let's check in with our objectives. So far, we have really covered objectives one, two, three, and four around nuclear reactions and radioactivity. Today, we're gonna to be focused on the blue highlighted stuff. Objective five or 7.3, topic 7.3 can discuss the structure of subatomic particles and their properties, and you'll see some kind of crazy vocabulary coming up like leptons and quarks and bosons and baryons, hadrons, mesons. So we're gonna learn all about those. We'll also focus partially on objective six, again, still topic 7.3. We'll focus on the conservation laws side of things. I really like talking about these topics and learning about these topics because this is relatively new science. So these theories were really created and started to become reality in about like the 1970s. And it wasn't until 2012 that we made a really, really key measurement that kind of confirmed that this theory has um, some reality to it. And so this is an exciting thing to learn about. This is something that, you know, when your parents, grandparents went to high school, they probably, this, this theory didn't really exist back then. So it's really, really new and relevant and present. So let's dive in with a quick warm up. For this warm up, I'd like you to complete the following reactions, questions one through four, and this might remind you a lot of radioactivity. So pause the video here, try these out, and then play the video to check your answers. Checking those warm-up answers, question number one was alpha decay. This could have been written as a 4,2 alpha particle, or it could have been written as a 4,2 helium. Number two was beta negative decay. You could have written a 0, negative 1, beta negative, or you could have written a 0, negative 1, E, standing for electron. And don't forget that you have this electron neutrino that comes along for the ride. Number three was gamma decay. Notice how the proton number, the nucleon number, they don't change. Meaning what does change is a release of energy. So you get a gamma, zero, zero gamma, also known as a zero, zero photon being released. Last but not least, question four, this is beta positive decay. You get a zero plus one beta positive. You could also write this as a zero plus one E, which stands for a positron. I know that's a little bit weird. And of course, coming along for the ride is going to be this neutrino here. Oh, and I forgot actually before this should have been an anti-electron neutrino. So I'll add that line over the neutrino to show it's an anti-electron neutrino in number two. Sorry about that. Now notice the things that are in green are a little bit strange to us still. In the last lecture, we asked, uh, just trust us, it comes along for the ride. Just trust us, this is like an anti-electron. And today we're really gonna work to understand these. So let's start by discussing what we call the standard model. The standard model is a way of organizing all of the elementary particles. What do I mean by elementary particles? I mean, they are the smallest particles that we think exist. We have no theory that says that there's anything smaller than these guys. So these are really the building blocks of everything that we know in our universe. In orange up here, you have the quarks. In green, you have the leptons. In blue, you have bosons. And in purple, you have the Higgs boson. Now we're gonna talk more about each one of these different categories and why they're called what they're called. But I wanna show you this rep representation because the Higgs boson is right in the middle. And this is a really important part of the standard model. The theory is that the Higgs boson gives all the other particles mass. And without the Higgs boson, this theory kind of starts to fall apart. So that's why the Higgs is right in the middle and very exciting in 2012, we had the first observations of the Higgs boson, the first data that we could actually collect to confirm its existence. So up until 2012, it was just a theory. 
Now you'll see the standard model represented in lots of different ways. You'll see this kind of circular representation. Perhaps the most common representation of the standard model though looks somewhat like this. It reminds me of the periodic table and it reminds me of that because just like the periodic table is organizing elements to highlight patterns, we are now organizing our elementary particles and it's organized in such a way that highlights those patterns. So let's dive in and take a look at the quarks. Those are represented in purple here. The quarks have some very funny names. There's an up quark, a down quark, a charm quark, a strange quark, a top quark, and a bottom quark. And you'll see as we start to discuss the properties that the up and down are very appropriately named. They have some similar properties that they share in common. The charm and strange kind of go together and the top and the bottom kind of go together. You'll also see some properties going across. So the up charm and top sharing some properties, the down strange and bottom sharing the properties. So these are not only arranged by color, but they are arranged in terms of properties that we'll talk about in a moment. We also have the leptons. The leptons are going to be our electron, we already know this guy, a muon and a tau, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. So you can see on the bottom are all of our neutrinos, they're going to share some properties, but that each neutrino has like a specific type, we call this the flavor of the neutrino, an electron, muon, or tau flavored neutrino. Yeah, that's right, like chocolate flavored ice cream. And you can see that there are these um, shared, even in their names, an electron neutrino matches the electron. A muon neutrino matches that muon, a tau neutrino matches the tau. And so again, we're gonna see lots of patterns. These are arranged in a very specific way. These are all going to be called fermions. So the quarks and the leptons, these are all called fermions, okay? That's kind of our big category of what we call quarks and leptons. Over here on the right is where you get your force carriers or your interactions or your bosons. And I want you to know that these exist. I want you to be familiar with them, but we're not really gonna dive into the bosons until our next lecture. You will hear things like a gluon, a photon, a Z boson, a W boson, and of course that really important Higgs boson that we were talking about earlier. So we're going to kind of set the bosons aside and really focus in on the fermions, our quarks and leptons today. Now I should tell you that for each of our fermions, each of our quarks and each of our leptons, there are going to be antimatter counterparts meaning that an up quark has an anti-up quark. A charm quark has an anti-charm quark, and so on. Just like for our leptons, an electron has an anti-electron, a muon has an anti-muon, and so on. The antimatter versions of things are really going to be the same in every way, but the exact opposite. So for example, we know that an electron has a charge of negative one, and so an anti-electron will have the same charge, negative one, but opposite, positive one. They are the same in every way except the exact opposite. Take all of those properties and make them opposites. And we'll see how that plays out in a minute with the properties. As you guys know from radioactivity, the way that we write the antiparticle is by putting a little line over the top. So for example, if I have a bottom quark, I would write B. But if I have an anti-bottom quark, I would write B with a little line over it. That little line over it is showing me it's the antimatter counterpart. So although our standard model, this table here, is only showing us all of the regular particles, we need to remember that for all six quarks, there are six anti-quarks. For all six leptons, there are six anti-leptons. 
I have this other note down here that's specific to quarks. It's called quark confinement. Quark confinement is essentially saying that you can never have a quark on its own. So I can never in nature actually observe just a bottom quark or even just an anti-bottom quark. Those are not possible. They do not exist on their own. Instead, quarks will start to combine. So you might get a combination where you have a quark and an anti-quark. Or the order that you write this in doesn't matter, so I suppose we could say an anti-quark and quark, which is really the same thing. For example, you could have an up anti-S, or you could write this anti-S up. These are actually the same. So our up quark can't exist on its own. Our anti-S quark can't exist on our, its own. But together in this pair, they can exist. Another way that quarks can combine with each other is to form triplets. A quark, quark, quark. Or an anti-quark, an anti-quark, and an anti-quark. For example, I could write U, 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 up, 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 or anti-U, anti-U, anti-U. Those can actually exist. But on its own, an up quark would not exist. On its own, an anti-up quark would not exist. So quark confinement is really telling us that quarks don't exist on their own. They come in these two categories. We call this category over here our quark anti-quark or anti-quark quark. We call this the meson category. And over here, we have our baryons. That's a quark, 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 or an anti-quark, anti-quark, anti-quark. It's hard to say. So let's try to organize our thinking. We're starting to get a lot of new vocabulary words here. Let's organize our thinking. Okay, so at our top level today, we are talking about fermions. Fermions are referring to the quarks and the leptons. Okay. Again, our quarks here up, down, charge, strange, top, bottom. And our leptons here, an electron, electron neutrino, a muon, muon neutrino, and a tau, and a tau neutrino. Of course, each one of these also has its antimatter counterparts. There we go. Now we know that quarks can't exist on their own our quarks will combine in order to become mesons or baryons. Remember, mesons are going to be a quark and an anti-quark. I'm using a Q there just as a placeholder to represent a quark. Or an anti-quark-quark combination. And baryons are going to be a quark-quark-quark or an anti-quark, anti-quark, anti-quark combination. We call mesons and baryons, we call these hadrons, sometimes pronounced hadrons. So our quarks combine to form hadrons. One type of hadron is a meson, another type of hadron is a baryon. Again, our elementary particles here, our quarks and our leptons, both types of fermions. 
whew, a lot of new vocabulary going on here, and it'll take some time and practice to get used to this, this new language. I want to start talking about the properties. I've been hinting at properties and why we arrange our quarks and our leptons in such a way in that standard model. There are going to be four properties that we're going to focus on. I want you to know there are actually more properties that like scientists know of and examine. For example, color is a property of all of these little particles. And uh, we are not going to focus on that in IB physics. Okay. So we're going to be focused on charge. You're probably very familiar with charge already. I mean, charge as in like an electron's negative, a proton's positive sort of thing. We are going to focus on lepton number, baryon number, and strangeness. That's right, we have a property called strangeness. So I want you to think of this almost like um, in the U.S. when I was a kid I would collect baseball cards and each of the baseball players had different stats, different things that were specific to them. I want you to think of these properties as kind of the baseball card for each of these little particles. Here are their stats, here's the things that describe them. And I want to bring your attention to the data booklet in order to understand each of these properties. Under subtopic 7.3 in your data booklet, you're going to see your quarks and your leptons. Okay. Let's first focus on the leptons. I'm going to start over here on the right side. We can see the charge of our leptons we can see that all of these top ones, an electron, a muon, and a tau, they all have a charge of negative one. The neutrinos though, down here, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, a tau neutrino, they all have zero charge, they are neutral. So the charge is more or less just listed in your data booklet for leptons. You will also see this uh, little note down here that all leptons have a lepton number of one. So all of these guys, all of our leptons have a lepton number of one or positive one. I always like to carry that positive through to make sure I'm not just dropping it. All of our anti-leptons, all of our anti-particles will of course have negative one, right? They're the same but opposite in every way. So we have charge, we have lepton number. What you don't see listed over here on the right side is baryon number. That's because leptons are not baryons. Take a look at that. Our leptons in no way relate to baryons. And so all of our leptons actually have a baryon number of zero. They are not baryons. They don't even relate to baryons. And similarly, for our final property, strangeness, strangeness is related to the strange quark. Let's come on back up. Our leptons are in no way related to the strange quark. And so for that reason, the strangeness of all of our leptons is going to also be zero. So there's our four properties, charge, lepton number, baryon number, and strangeness over here in lepton land. Let's take a look over on our other side. Let's focus on the quarks. So I'm going to be on this side on the left, our quarks. Well, first you can see, again, we are given charge. Our up, charm, and top quarks have a charge of two-thirds times E, E being the charge of an electron. And our bottom row, down, strange, and bottom quarks have a negative one-third E charge. Again, that E standing for the charge of our electron, our elementary charge. So our charges are given for our quarks. Next up, we have lepton number. Now, this is strange. Our quarks over here have nothing to do with leptons. 
They are two totally different categories. And for that reason, all of our quarks have a lepton number of zero. Next up, we have baryon number. We are given baryon number over here. You can see that our top row has a baryon number of one third. And our bottom row has a baryon number of one third as well. And last but not least, we have strangeness. Strangeness, you have this little note here. All quarks have a strangeness number of zero, except the strange quark that has a strangeness number of negative one. So the only quark affected by this is our strange quark. Our strange quark has a strangeness of negative one. Everyone else has a strangeness of zero. You can tell that strangeness is really the strangest of our properties. Okay, so we're given a lot of information in our data booklet. This is super, super helpful information for us. I want to take a moment and practice this information. I want to apply this information using some examples. So this would be a great time to open up the data booklet on your computer if it's not already open, or get out your physical copy. So I have this big old table of practice for us. We're gonna start together, fill out the first few ones together, and then you'll get some practice on your own. On the left here, I've defined a particle symbol and the particle's name. You can ignore, ignore the composition column for now. We'll get to that when we get to the bottom of the table. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to fill out the family, to use that vocabulary, baryon, meson, lepton, quark, hadron. And then to identify our four properties, charge, baryon number, lepton number, and strangeness for each one. So let's work, walk through the first few rows together. First, we have D for down. This is a quark. This is simply a quark on its own. We know that a down quark could not actually exist on its own, but let's nonetheless identify its four properties. The charge of a down quark, the charge is negative one third E. I'm gonna simply write negative one third because I'm kind of using E, our elementary charge, as like my base unit. Our down quark has a baryon number of positive one-third. Again, I'm really intentional to write that positive so that I know that I've actually thought through, I didn't just forget. A lepton number, well, my quark, my down quark has nothing to do with leptons. It's a totally different category. It's not a lepton, it gets a zero number. And last but not least, we have strangeness. Remember, all quarks have a strangeness number of zero except the strange quark. So this down quark has nothing to do with the strange quark. It gets zero strangeness. Now that I've identified my down quark and its properties, my next line here, an anti-down quark, well, this should be easy. It's gonna be exactly the same in every way, but opposite. This is an anti-quark. Its charge is now positive one-third, the exact same but opposite. Its baryon number is negative one-third, the exact same but opposite. Its lepton number and strangeness, well, they're the exact same and there's no real opposite of zero, so it's just zero. So once you figure out the regular version of something, its anti-matter version, is gonna be really easy. So I want you to pause the video here and I want you to give this a try all the way up until the positron. I'm gonna work through this as well and then unpause to check your answers. Okay, take a moment to check your answers. You may start to notice patterns that make this a little easier. For example, after identifying the family, if they are leptons, their baryon number is automatically going to be zero. 
because leptons have nothing to do with bariums. Or for example, if you've identified them as a lepton, you know that they are gonna have some non-zero lepton number. And of course, if you see strange, you're gonna get some strangeness, otherwise you don't. I do wanna point out that there are a few of these that can be written in slightly different ways. For example, our electron and our positron. Yes, that's the positron from our warm-up that we learned in radioactivity that you were like, what is that? You may see an electron written as E negative and a positron written as E positive. These are the same. E negative is the same as writing E and E positive, calling it a positron, is the same as saying the anti-electron or an E with a line over it. The kind of tricky thing about that is if you see E plus, you might be like, oh, I don't quite know if that's matter or antimatter. That plus stands for a positive one charge. So you'd come up here and say, oh, normally my electron is a negative one charge. So if I'm seeing a positive one charge, I must be talking about an anti-electron or a positron. And so you'll see this with muons, you'll see it written as like mu plus, that's the same as saying an anti-muon. Or a mu minus is the same as saying a regular muon. So just be aware that if you do see this sort of superscript of a plus or a minus, you really want to come back to this table and think through whether it's regular matter or antimatter. So I want to return to our table and give you a few more examples. You'll notice that these examples are a little more complex than what we've seen before. For example, let's work through a proton and an antiproton. So a proton is actually a type of baryon. A proton is composed of an up quark, an up quark, and a down quark. When I see those three quarks in a row, I know it's a baryon. The charge of my proton is going to be the charge of an up, an up, and a down quark all added together. So an up quark is two-thirds E. Another up quark would be another two-thirds E. And a down quark would be a minus one-third E. Let's record that. We had a plus two-thirds, plus two-thirds, and a minus one-third. Of course, this simplifies to simply a positive three over three or a positive one charge. This makes me really happy because my prior knowledge about protons tells me it should be positive. We're going to use the same sort of technique for a baryon number as well. For baryon number, I'm gonna have an up, an up and a down quark. So I'm gonna have one third plus one third plus one third. which gives me a total of a positive one baryon number. This is most excellent because a positive one baryon number matches the fact that this is a baryon. All baryons are gonna have positive one baryon numbers. Of course, our lepton number, we could add up all of the lepton numbers, but these are quarks. They have nothing to do with leptons. So we would do zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. And same with strangeness. We have no strange quarks, so we're adding up all zeros to get zero. And again, an antiproton. An antiproton is going to be the antiparticle of a proton. It's going to be the same, but opposite in every way. So I want you to pause the video, work through a neutron, work through a pion, work through a kaon, and then check your answers. Take a moment to check your answers. I should point out a small typo. This should say anti-SD, which means it will have a positive one strangeness. Apologies about that typo. Again, I'm looking for patterns to help me out. Anytime I have a baryon or anti-baryon, I'm getting a positive one or negative one baryon number. Again, I can add those individual parts, but it should, I should expect a positive one or a negative one. 
all of these guys are examples of um, quarks combining. So are my lepton number is zero and my strangeness is zero until I get a strange or an anti-strange quark, in which case then I have to start noticing. Also notice that my pi on has a positive zero and negative. That's how I came up with the charge, positive zero and negative. And same for my k on, positive zero and negative. Okay. Now there are so, so many particles, like tons and tons of particles that exist. There's lambdas, there's, there's all these weird ones. So for the IB exam, what you need to know is the composition of a proton being up, up, down, and a neutron being up, down, down. You must memorize these two. But for any other ones, like a pi on, a k on, a whatever, IB will give you the composition and you'll be able to think through the rest. The only ones that you won't have the composition for are proton, up, up, down, and neutron, up, down, down. Okay, so all of this, we can identify lots and lots of different properties. We have our four properties, lots of different particles. Why do we care? Well, we are going to start looking at interactions of these particles, interactions at the subatomic level. For example, this interaction is a proton plus a negative pion is going to produce a neutron and a neutral pion. Notice how you're given the composition of our negative pion and neutral pion, but you must know the composition for proton is up, up, down, and neutron is up, down, down. You must have those memorized. Our job right now is gonna see if this interaction, can it really happen? Is it possible? And in order to figure out if this interaction is possible, we need to check some conservation laws. In order for something to happen in our universe, we need conservation of charge. The charge before and the charge after must be the same. We need conservation of baryon number. The baryon number before and after must be the same. We need conservation of lepton number. The before and after lepton numbers must total the same. And in most cases, we need conservation of strangeness. There's actually a few cases where you don't need this. So I'm gonna put a little asterisk that there are some exceptions here. And we're gonna talk about those exceptions next class. So we're gonna to have to check conservation of these properties in order to tell if this reaction is indeed possible. I'm gonna start by drawing this little table if it wasn't already drawn for me. And what I really like to do is highlight this break between the before and the after. And I always line that break up with my arrow. And then I start to identify in my before, I have a proton. Proton is a type of baryon with composition up, up, down. And I have a meson, a negative pi, anti, up, down. So this means that for my proton, well, I could look back at my data booklet, but I already know a proton charge adds up to be one. It is a baryon, so it's a positive one baryon number. It has nothing to do with leptons and there is no strangeness. My negative pi, an anti-up down, is going to have a charge of negative one. I could look back and add up the charge of an anti-up and down. It should come out to be negative one, but my biggest hint is that this is a negative pi on. Looking at the baryon number, I predict this baryon number would be a zero. Let's do a quick check. An anti-up, so we're talking a negative one-third for the anti, plus a down, a positive one-third, indeed a negative one-third and a, and a positive one-third would cancel to be zero, baryon number. 
This has nothing to do with leptons and there's no strange or anti-strange particles. Let's take a look at the after. We have a neutron, this is a baryon, and a neutral pion, which must be a meson, because I see those two quarks together. I already know that a neutron has neutral or zero charge. I could look up the charge of a U, D, D, and add them together and find that too. This is a baryon. It has nothing to do with leptons and no strange or anti-strange quarks. My neutral pion. I could look up the charge of an up and an anti-up, but I could also look at the superscript telling me the charge should come out to be zero. This is not a baryon. It has nothing to do with leptons, and there are no strange particles. So let's do a check. Is charge conserved? I have plus one and minus one in the beginning, so a total of zero equals zero plus zero at the end. Yes, charge has been conserved. Baryon number, is baryon number conserved? A positive one and zero turns into a positive one and zero, yep. And then of course my lepton number and my strangeness are conserved because they're all just zeros. So this is a reaction that could happen in our universe. This is possible. Let's try one more together here. This one, we, we have a neutron turning into a proton, electron, and an anti-electron neutrino. In case you don't recognize this, this is really beta negative decay. This is simply a, radi a radioactivity reaction. I'm gonna highlight that before and after split here, lining that up with my arrow. A neutron is a baryon. It has a composition of up, down, down. A charge of zero, positive one baryon number, and nothing to do with leptons or strange particles. A proton is an up, up, down with a positive one charge. It is also a baryon. It has nothing to do with lepton and strangeness. An electron, a regular old electron is a lepton. It comes by itself, no problem. I know electrons have a negative one charge. They have nothing to do with baryons. They definitely have nothing to do with strange quarks and they are a regular lepton. Last but not least, we have an anti-lepton here, the anti-electron neutrino. It comes on its own. Its charge is zero, nothing to do with baryons, is an antimatter particle of a lepton. It has nothing to do with strangeness, so let's check. It looks like charge is conserved, zero at the beginning, plus one, minus one, plus zero at the end, that works. Baryon numbers conserved, plus one at the beginning, plus one, plus zero, plus zero at the end. Lepton number is conserved, zero at the beginning, and zero plus one, minus one at the end. And strangeness is conserved, all zeros, this is possible. So I'd like to finish up this lecture with a gear up problem. Here you have a proton and a negative pion turning into a neutral kaon and a neutral lambda. Give this one a try. See if this is possible or not possible. Checking your answer to the gear up problem. This should be a possible reaction. Charge is conserved baryon numbers conserved, lepton numbers conserved, and even strangeness is conserved. I want to remind you to be patient with yourself that this takes some time and practice to get faster and to get used to these properties. And a lot of these properties are new to you. So give yourself a little bit of space to be a learner, to practice this and to develop these skills.